My mother always told me that I was a child of winter. I suppose it started from a young age. There are pictures and home videos of me as little more than a toddler, leaping into snowbanks and carving out tiny snow angels in my little neon blue snowsuit. When my sisters and brother, some are children, all of them, would beg my parents to return home so they could envelop themselves in blankets and gorge themselves in hot chocolate, I would remain indignant, refusing to leave my frosty playground behind. Even throughout adolescence, I was obsessed with a winter landscape. I loved the beauty of dancing snow flickering through the air, the way my small town landscape became entombed in soft, billowing white. When I was seven years old and stuck inside with the flu, missing a perfect snowy December afternoon, mind you, I discovered my grandfather's old 35mm film camera tucked between dusty packing boxes. It felt sturdy between my hands, like some old treasure. As soon as the flu left me, I took my new prize outside and began taking photos of my frigid wonderland. Leafless branches silhouetted against the evening sun, an unflowing frozen river beneath an old stony bridge, a red squirrel peeking its head out from a hole in a tree. The scenes that I had always loved, but had never had the chance to properly express to my friends or family. It was around this time that I met something. Even now, after all these long years, I can still remember everything that happened that day. I had been out in the small birch woods behind my parents' house, nine years old and filled with glee. The first snowfall of the year had graced us the night before, signifying the dying breath of the tyrannical summer. Armed with my trusty camera, I had rushed out the door, my parents yelling at me through the kitchen window so that I would stay close to the house. But it was useless. The gentle snowfall intoxicated me, and within minutes I was out of sight of my house. The birch trees were barren and cracked, standing like emaciated giants far above me. Stepping into the woods felt like stepping into a painting. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a winter hare dart by. I aimed my camera, readying the perfect shot, but I stopped myself. I had taken plenty of pictures of hares before. No, I needed something better. This was the first shot of the season, after all. It had to be special. Decked out in green snowsuit and boots, I was almost certainly not blending in with my surroundings. Everywhere I went, I saw hares and squirrels, and even a few deer rushing away from me as if their lives depended on it. My young mind couldn't help but take it personally. Disney movies had led me to believe that animals were much friendlier than this. To my continued confusion, I saw a panicked squirrel run towards me, dart around my legs, and continue into the forest. Looking back, I can't believe how I didn't see the signs. Like a fool, I decided to explore the area where the animals were running from. Pushing branches from my face, I stepped into a clearing in the woods. And then I saw it. The most beautiful winter landscape I had ever encountered. I stood on the shoreline of the river that flowed behind my home. The sun hung low overhead, as if it was still working up the energy to finish rising. From where I stood, I could see the shore covered in perfect, untouched snow. Birch trees stood to my left and right, framing my peripheral with their skeletal grey branches and bone-white flesh. Before me stood the frozen river, almost entirely still beneath the blue-grey ice. Only a patch of the river still revealed the running water beneath the ice, having melted away by the lazy sun. The exposed water rippled with the sun's shining light, presenting me 
with a finishing touch to a perfectly composed photo of whites, blues and oranges. The beauty of that simple scene left me breathless, and without a thought, I raised my camera, adjusted the dials, and took the shot. I didn't take another. I knew it was perfect. For a few moments, I just stood before this gift of nature, my youthful mind completely devoid of anything else. It took the sound of snapping branches to break me out of my trance. The sound had surprised me. I blinked my dry eyes a few times, turning away from my landscape. Behind me stood the entire birch forest, tall and immense. Though the woods had welcomed me earlier, I now felt uneasy looking at the maze of trees. I felt the hairs at the base of my neck creep up. I saw movement out of the corner of my eye. I thought I had seen one of the trees move. I gasped out, taking a step back toward the river. I kept my eyes glued on the woods. Nothing else moved. A cold wind blew across the ground, drifting it with a billowy top layer of snow. I felt that cold in my bones. To tell you the truth, I still do to this day. I took a few steps forward and stopped. Everything in my head told me not to go further, not to go back into the woods. But the shoreline that I stood upon was narrow. The only other way home would be across the ice. After minutes of panicked pondering, I forced myself to remember the beauty of the woods, the birch trees, which now looked as if they were jagged bones of the earth, were also the backdrop to so many happy childhood memories. The woods had been the setting for making snowmen with my sisters and brother, sledding, igloos, and of course my photography. With all the resolve I could muster, I shoved down the fear and stepped forward though the hair on my neck stayed upright. As soon as I stepped between the trees, I felt the cold again. The frozen breath of winter awoken. I felt my teeth chatter, knees buckle. It wasn't natural, this cold. It stung my face, and I recoiled, pressing my jacket sleeve against it. I could feel tiny tears in the corner of my eyes, though they would freeze as soon as they appeared. I took shaky steps forward, wild eyes darting every time I heard a sound. The wind howled between the branches and the trees, quiet at first, and then louder as I walked. The trees moaned and shifted beneath the winter winds, the mournful cacophony of nature. I froze mid-step, my eyes wide and body stiff. In between the howling wind and creaking trees, I heard someone say my name. Not in the way a concerned parent calls out to you, or the way an annoying sibling tries to get your attention. No, there was no love in this familiar word. The voice I heard was creaking and slow, one I had never heard before, nor wished to hear again. It wasn't a call, but a whisper. One that had somehow reached me, despite the eerie sounds of nature. I heard it again, closer. Either from the cold or from fear, I was frozen in place. Only my eyes would move where I would tell them to. My body was frozen like the landscape itself. Again, the whisper grew in my ears. I felt my already panicked breathing quicken. My name, again, whispered from behind me, getting closer. The sounds of my name were grotesquely stretched by the creaking voice, and I heard the hints of malice. And then, the woods were silent. 
No wind, no creaking trees, no spectral voice among the still snow. Something grabbed my shoulder. I felt terror rise in my throat in a hoarse, guttural scream. The something grasped me tightly, and pain shot through my shoulder. I darted my eyes down towards my shoulder. Fingers did not hold me. Long, grey appendages that bent at odd angles had pierced through my jacket. They looked like the barren and dead branches of the oak trees above me. The something whispered my name again, death in its voice. I screamed again, tearing my shoulder away. Despite the cold, I ran. With God as my witness, I ran. I ran through the snow banks, over fallen trees and branches, in between patches of ice and bare earth. My steps were awkward from the height of the snow. I held my camera with both hands so as to not drop it, though without the use of my arms to balance myself, I nearly tripped multiple times. The sound of the winter winds picked up again with a furious roar, tearing through the trees behind me. I felt the torrent of wind pressed against my back, and I knew something was chasing me. Again, I felt the ice-cold, branch-like fingers touch me, brushing against the base of my neck. I could feel the cold tears against my cheek freeze as I threw my camera to the ground, using my arms to help balance myself. I ran faster as the something called out to me. My house came into view through the trees. Help! I had screamed. Help! Help me! Help! The something whispered behind me with this ghoulish, creaking voice. Help! Help me! I screamed in terror, exhaustion overcoming my lungs. I could feel the burning heat in my legs beg me to stop, to take a breather, but the edge of the forest came into sight, and, with an insane surge of fear-driven energy, I threw myself out of the forest and into my house's snow backyard. My parents, God bless them, were running from the house before I had even stood up. My flannel pyjamas wearing mother had frantically thrown on her winter boots. My father ran through the snow barefoot, wearing only a robe. Help! I screamed again, my voice hysteric. There's something in the woods. My parents caught me, held me as I screamed over and over. They tried to console me, to reassure me that everything was okay. And yet still, I shouted, Help! Help! Help me! A few hours later, I was enveloped in a warm blanket with an untouched mug of steaming hot chocolate on the coffee table before me. My parents tried to calm me. They themselves were calmer now, but still deeply concerned for their terrified child. They told me that the woods were big and scary for a little one, and that it was okay to be afraid. When I told them of the whispered words, of the branched fingers on my shoulder, they told me that I had imagined it. The whispers were just the sound of the wind across the snow. The holes in my jacket were from a low-hanging branch. My parents, truly the warmest, most logical people in the world, managed to calm me down. I started to believe that, just maybe, my experience in the woods had been the work of an overactive imagination. My sisters and brother even began teasing me for it, saying that the something would come take me away. And yet, despite my family's reassurance, I could not shake the feeling that they were wrong. Sometimes, when I looked out of the woods from my warm bedroom's window, I would feel the hair stand up as it had on that day. If I looked long enough, no matter how many blankets I had on, I would start to feel the creeping cold that had frozen me to my bones on that day. It took me 30 years and a lot of therapy to get over those memories. I was never comfortable going out in the winter by myself again. As I grew older, 
I left my northern home to move south for school and never looked back. Nowadays, I make a living as a nature photographer for a national magazine specialized in old school film techniques, though I refuse to work anywhere that is snow during the winter season. A few days ago, I got a call from my aging mother. My father had recently passed and she was selling our family house. My sister's brother and I went up to visit to help her pack away our childhood memories. From my mother's front porch, I looked out at the woods, green and warm beneath the summer sun. Whether it was the time away or the lack of frozen death, I no longer feared this place. With my brother as backup, I went down to face my childhood fears. We walked for a while, reminiscing on our youth, pointed out to the areas where we made our snow angels and our forts, as well as the beach where we would swim during the summer. Filled with warmth, we were headed back towards the house, when I saw a glint of metal partially buried beside a tree. My old camera. Despite the fear I had felt that day, I remembered that perfect shot. The blues and the whites and the oranges. The last normal day of my youth. I picked up the camera, joking with my brother. I doubted the photo would look great after all this time, but I am something of a wizard when it comes to developing film. I returned down south. I developed the photo about three hours ago. To my surprise, it had only partial damage to it, blotching out the sun, but leaving much of the shot intact. Reminiscing, I told myself that my parents had been right after all. Beneath the red light of the dark room, I had happily taken the sights in, reminding myself of the days of the young winter lover, marvelling at the river, the snow, the trees. And... That's when I saw it. Standing amongst the birch trees, hidden just behind, I saw a figure staring back at me. It was tall and incredibly thin, with a body that was the same waxy white as the trees that surrounded it. Its arms and legs were twice as long as its body, branch thin and grey as death. At the end of its limbs were the branch-like fingers that had torn into my jacket thirty years ago, thin and long and sharp. Atop its giant, emaciated body, the something's featureless, porcelain white face stared back at me, as if through the photograph itself. Its eyes were black and white and empty, its mouth a broken, jagged crack in the mask-like face. I fell onto the floor within my dark room, the horrible memories flooding back. I screamed, just as I had that day. I screamed and screamed and screamed until I could only whimper. I felt the cold, the hair on my neck, the horrible grasp of the something on my shoulder. My family won't believe me. My friends will think I'm insane. But I need to share this story now. Because I don't think I have much time left. Because even though it's 30 degrees Celsius where I live, snow just began to fall outside my window. <laughs>